to this webinar. I'm Len Montgomery, um, and I'm the Public Lands Campaign Director with Environment America. Um, really excited to be here today with the Yak Valley Forest Council. Um, and um, both of our organizations are members of the Climate Forest Campaign. So uh, again, welcome. Uh, this is part of a series of webinars doing a deeper dive into threats to our forests across the country. And we'll take questions from the audience. You can use the Q&A function in Zoom at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the chat, and we will answer questions at the end. Um, Sean, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, okay, next slide. So I will start with a quick overview of what we're trying to recover and protect. So you've probably heard of an old growth forest, but what does that really mean? Um, so when we're looking at old growth forests, there are a couple things to look for in the structure. So we're looking at forests that have developed naturally while recovering from natural disturbances, such as fires, we are looking at forests that have diversity of tree species, sizes, and ages. We're looking at forests that have standing and down dead trees and a diversity of understory plants. So that's the bottom layer and healthy soil. And these forests provide habitat for a diversity of insects, birds, and other wildlife. Next slide. As you can see from this photo, old growth is wild and messy. Natural forests are really dynamic. Disturbances are always changing things. So healthy old growth forests are not just big trees, but also the processes and structures that help support the pieces of that ecosystem. And it takes over a hundred years to achieve this. There aren't many forests or areas that are more than a hundred years old. So our effort is focused on not just protecting what remains, but recovering what was lost. So we're calling for protections of forests and stands that are approximately 80 years old so that they can grow into old growth in another 20, 30, and 50 years. Next slide. This uh, is an example of something that's not an old growth forest. This is a plantation. So sometimes you may hear that forests are being replanted or trees are being replanted, but unfortunately replanting often results in what we call a plantation, not a functional ecosystem. So you can see that these trees are the same size, same species, same age. Uh, next slide. So why do we want to protect these? There are so many reasons, but the big one that we're focused on in the climate forest campaign is uh, that we wanna protect them as a climate solution. Older, bigger trees capture and store more carbon. Bottom line, this is the cheapest, most effective carbon capture technology. And all we have to do is let them grow. Next slide. In addition to helping slow climate change, They'll also help us adapt to what's already happening with climate change. So you can see here a couple ways that they do that. Uh, safeguarding biodiversity, uh, reducing flood and erosion, uh, increasing availability of drinking water, and possessing features that are more resistant to fire, such as older, larger trees that are less likely to, uh, to burn um, or, or uh, or die from, um, from fire and to spread it. Next slide. And of course, there are other benefits, cultural use, outdoor recreation, mental and spiritual well-being. But you're all here mostly to learn about the Black Ram Project. So I want to turn it over to Rick Bass, who is going to tell us about uh, why this area is so special what the threats are and what's been going on with the campaign. So next slide, and then I'll turn it over. Thank you, Lynn and Sean. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Fantastic. 
Um, yes, it's an exciting campaign, and, and this, this proposed Black Ram sale up in the Yak uh, is, I think, the poster for us for all that's wrong with our current uh, relationship to forest and, and logging on public lands. Uh, uh, the Kootenai National Forest is uh, the largest national forest in Montana. Historically, it produces more timber uh, and from the Yak than any other valley in the state. Uh, all that's left really to, uh, to meet their, their timber targets anymore is the old and mature forest, and that's what they're proposing in this Black Ram sale. It's being represented, it won't surprise you to know, as a fuels reduction project, uh, even though, as Lynn pointed out, these, these ancient trees between 300 and 800 years old are um, the last place to worry about fire. It's way in the backcountry, Black Ram is. It's up on the Canadian border. It's about 12 miles from the community of Yak downwind. The fire will have already gone up there. It won't be reversing and coming back. It's upslope. It won't be running downhill and into the wind, those 12 miles. It's just it's just timber greed. And so I'm really grateful to the uh, the campaign for identifying this and, and supporting the uh, the campaign to stop this this egregious sale. We've been fighting it for many years, five or six years since it was first being talked about. And we've been able to, to hold it up this far to, to have these kinds of conversations and discussions. Um, the amazing thing about the forest at Black Ram is that it, the majority of it is never burned. Uh, the Forest Service is proposing to regen, regeneration harvest, essentially affected clear cuts almost a thousand contiguous acres of this amazing primary forest that's never been logged and never burned. It's up in a high elevation swamp is why it's never, never burned. Uh, you walk through the forest and there's just this incredible mushiness of, of spongy, rotting, giant carcasses beneath your feet. And you can see these ghost outlines in the, um, in the forest floor, you know, it's covered with moss and, and fungus, uh, you know, which is incredibly, bright emerald green in, in, in the spring and summer, but you can see these lattices almost as if with x-ray technology all the way down, like this giant on top of this giant on top of this one. And there's, as, as Lynn identified in, in old forest conditions, there's an incredible diversity of stand and size, structure, and species, it being the yak. It's an uh, incredibly biologically diverse uh, ecosystem. In fact, the, uh, the Kootenai National Forest has Fully 25% of the uh, entire state of Montana's uh, species of concern, sensitive, endangered, threatened species are found on this one forest. Uh, it's such a, a scientific treasure house. It's a place to go in and study why has this forest not burned in forever? Uh, why? How does it protect itself against wildfire? What are the self-sustaining mechanisms that it has? What? Uh, what is the quality of the mycelium and mycorrhizal network going on, you know, just beneath the surface, a foot beneath the surface, 10 feet beneath the surface? How far down do these carcasses go in this, this preserved, essentially forever, in this floating forest? It's, uh, it's like no place on, on Earth. It, it has a... Uh, it's just unrecognizable to me. I hesitate to say it has a sentience to it, because uh, I don't know what it is, but it, it, there's not like a communication between the forest and a, a visitor to the forest, uh, but there is, it has a presence that is not familiar to us, and, and it is an opportunity to study it instead of bulldoze it. Uh, even the Forest Service admits uh, that when they bulldoze it, if they're able to, to go forward with the sale, and then they will replant it with the plantation species that Lynn referenced, uh, in this case, white pine and larch. They acknowledge that 80 to 90 percent of those seedlings will die, will, will have what's called regeneration failure because it is uh, a different soil type up there than the, uh, than the uh, one preferred by the seedlings they're going to be planted. It's, it makes no sense. It, it's essentially climate madness, climate treason, climate sedition. It, it's being... Uh, executed in broad daylight. Apologies, I'm here at the hospital where the fastest internet in the county is, so there'll be people coming and going and trucks uh, idling and so forth. We're hoping that by protecting the old forest at, at Black Ram, we can use that as a foundational um, uh, 
example of a climate refuge, uh, a carbon bank in these giant trees. Some of the large trees, there's only one or two large trees per acre in this old forest, but they are the oldest representative in the forest and uh, uh, storing so much carbon that we can have a series of refuges like Black Ram along the northern tier of the United States, uh, up in the Tongass, up in Alaska, in the Northeast Cascades in Washington State, the, the old forest in the northern Selkirk in I northern Idaho, Black Ram in northwest Montana, of course, Glacier National Park, uh, going over into Minnesota, the Boundary Waters canoe area, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin's upper peninsula country, uh, New York's Adirondack, New Hampshire's White Mountain, Vermont, Northeast Kingdom, Maine's North Woods, um, all of these old forests along the northern tier storing carbon, which uh, our, our, our forests uh, absorb 12% of the carbon per year that we, our emissions that, that come out from burning fossil fuels. It's just, as Lynn said, the cheapest, most effective technology. All we have to do is commit to letting these old forests get older and bigger. Um, I'll show some slides here from from the YAC and, and visit briefly about uh, about the slides, and then we'll have some, some take action opportunities to help stop, rescind the Black Ram sale, that record of decision has been issued, and uh, yeah, and get a, a climate refuge established up here. Um, Sean, if I could trouble you please to, to move to the, uh, the first slide, thank you. Black Ram came apart came a point, came about as part of a, an executive order by the previous administration to increase volume of logging on public lands by 40%. Uh, never mind that, that uh, public lands logging only provides 3% of the nation's uh, timber supply. Uh, it was just free and easy liquidation. It was uh, begotten, you know, essentially theft of the public treasury. Uh, the previous administration also directed the uh, U.S. Forest Service and Department of Ag to avoid environmental impact statements in pursuing this 40% increase. That's how Black Ram came to be. That's how some other really bad sales came to be. Um, Black Ram is part of six contemporaneous contiguous sales on one ranger district alone on the Kootenai National Forest, totaling nearly 350,000 acres without a single EIS. We haven't talked specifically about the endangered, threatened, sensitive species in this area. Uh, none is more imperiled than the grizzly bear. We'll talk about that later. But the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service shows there are only three rolling tenure average of only three adult females with cubs in this entire valley. Um, next slide. So that's where black ram came from. Um, next slide. It's called a Trump zombie sale. Uh, next slide, please. This is where... Um, in 2018, uh, there was a little fire, a, a tiny fire, up in the northwest corner of the valley, up in the rocks, up above the swamp. Um, I, I can hold on that, that previous slide for a moment, Sean, please. Um, the Forest Service built a, a fire line, a 200-foot wide lane, straight lane all the way to Canada, up to the edge of the uh, proposed Black Ram unit saying that they were uh, going to protect the rest of the valley from fire by doing this. What they did was build a road to the proposed uh, logging of old growth. And they cut a lot of old growth and uh, limbed it, piled the slash, burned the slash, decked the big giants to sell. Uh, it was a logging operation more than a firefighting operation. And it's, it's really done a lot of damage already at the edge of the old forest. Uh, we're trying to restore the, the damage done during this so-called firefighting operation. Uh, now, next slide, please. If we can go to that Queen's Cup Beaverly slide, please. Yeah. The YAC, there's a, a little bit of a senescence going on in the forest floor. Uh, you see the, the uh, structure. These are actually very small uh, logs. There's a logs. Uh, all in trees, there is a, uh, the light comes down through all the different canopies in the, uh, we'll, we'll hold on this slide for a second, please. Uh, as I mentioned, there's all these different sizes and structures of age class, uh, 
and, and varying rates of senescence in, in the forest floor here. Uh, those golden needles on, that are adding to the structure and richness of the soil from the large, it's the world's only, uh, country's only deciduous conifer. And uh, it, it turns, its needles turn gold in the fall and blow off, and in the spring it starts all over again. Uh, next slide, please. Sure, I can see another slide now, please, Sean. Uh, this, these are current units, proposed unit 72, uh, one of a cluster of units that, again, is almost a thousand acres. Uh, uh, when, when you hear about the yak and about black ram, I think the most important thing besides old forest and mature forest and giant trees is, is water. The yak is, if not the wettest, one of the wettest spots in the state of Montana. It's the lowest elevation in the state of Montana. Uh, 1,888 feet, which is a surprising number. You look at Montana, Montana, and high peaks and mountainous, uh, which Western Montana is, but the Yak is extraordinarily wet. It, it's essentially it's Appalachian in, in its uh, landforms, uh, metamorphosed mountains rather than, than glaciation um, and, and igneous. It's uh, metamorphosed sediments, uh, very soft, low hills, and gathers and holds a lot of water. Clear cuts, of course, rob that water from the ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. I'm ready for it. Uh, thank you. Again, more uh, incredible diversity of forest substructure, forest floor. And you can see the creep of the green. Uh, there's always senescence going on in, in, the, in this old forest and always regeneration. It does not need uh, to be made resilient or restored uh, by the U.S. Forest Service. It needs to be preserved as, as a climate refuge. What's going on in there is, is a sustained across a thousand years of gap creation. One of the big ones leans over in that flash of light. Uh, there's regeneration of, of, of whatever uh, species happens to be in the area. Uh, Doug firs, uh, the balpin fir, Engelman spruce, hemlock, cedar, sometimes large, sometimes white pine, sometimes cottonwood, alder, willow, aspen. Every tree species in the valley is in this ancient forest. It is the most miraculous place in the valley, and we should be studying it, not hastening to uh, erase it. Biden, uh, President Biden on Earth Day, of course, issued the proclamation that's helped kick this campaign off to uh, inventory and protect old and mature forests on public lands throughout the country. Um, and that's what ironically and perversely spurred uh, the record of decision being signed. Uh, the Forest Service is in a rush now to erase this forest before it can be inventoried. And we really need your help uh, stopping that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Got maybe seven or eight more. Thank you, Sean. If I can have the next slide. Again, uh, senescence uh, equals habitat. Uh, never seen such density of, of snags in, in any forest up here or anywhere. Uh, this is a shot of that so-called fire line where they built a straight line into the edge of the old forest. Uh, that large tree, of course, did end up dying. Uh, a tree without a forest is, 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 is doomed uh, in this country. There's an incredible uh, synthesis and synchronization between the, the different species and the different um, types that it, it's not it's not it would not restore itself from being clear cut. Uh, next slide please. Yeah more more unit 72 senescence. Uh, when a tree falls over, leans down and starts to become part of the soil and, and nurse the, uh, the new regeneration. I think it's more alive in that death, as, at least as alive in that death as it was in any living upright. And we need to be measuring these giant carbon storing uh, carcasses that are, that are holding firm in this, this, in this forest floor. Uh, They're part of the equation also. 
Next slide, please. This carbon is going into the giant trees that it supports. I mentioned, I started to mention the light, the quality of light that comes down through all of these different layers of canopy in this gap created forest, this 800 year old forest, whatever, whatever its age is, we don't really know. Uh, it, it preceded the, uh, the age of the oldest trees. Let's just call it the thousand year old forest though. It's almost like, uh, the light is almost like a kind of music. It, you, it seems that you can, you can't hear it, but it just acts differently than and what we're accustomed to seeing light, it does seem like slow sound waves. And uh, I, talk, I want to talk real quickly a little bit about a project we're trying to do to help publicize the importance and singularity, the uniqueness of this old forest. Um, when the Forest Service built this giant road system going into the edge of the old forest, uh, some of the big, large, uh, big spruce at the, at the edge of the forest fell over and we went in and cut out a four foot length of one like a vertebrae from a whale. Uh, next slide please. And we uh, we wheelbarrowed it out of there and we sent it to a, a master luthier, um, uh, Kevin Kopp in Bozeman, Montana. He used to work for Gibson uh, guitars and he has these, he makes these incredible high-end guitars and we thought what would what would the old forest sound like if it could speak? What If we were to make an instrument out of um, a piece of wood from the old forest. So we've got this this old spruce that we took to him. We sprinkled water on it on the drive to Bozeman to keep it from cracking and checking. And, and uh, he's working on it right now, and it'll be ready in December. And uh, musicians around the country are volunteering to play uh, their chosen song of the resistance on on this uh, this craft guitar made from a length of ancient spruce from from the Black Ram project, the proposed timber sale. Uh, we'll keep you all tuned about about how that's going. Uh, next slide, slide please. And if you guys have any uh, recommendations for musicians to participate in the project, please let us know. Yeah, about grizzlies in the yak, um, as I mentioned, three females with cubs, only 20 to 25 uh, bears total in this million acre land mass. Uh, it is a transboundary population going back and forth into Canada, and the project is right on the Canadian border. Uh, next slide, please. One way to, to think about this forest at, at Black Ram is uh, as just a garden, uh, you know, not growing crops for people, but growing, uh, we don't even know what it's growing. Uh, and they're just scientific mysteries yet to be determined. And uh, uh, we hope it'll, by creating refuge, it'll be a point of scientific inquiry. Uh, next slide, please. We also hope it'll be a, a, a place for uh, arts and humanities to come be in the presence of such ancient uh, life, ancient forest, and, and create uh, art projects and, and be uh, stimulated, motivated by uh, to, for artistic inquiry as well as scientific. Um, these photos of grizzlies are by Montana photographer Brad Orsted working in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. There is a lot of bear activity in uh, the Black Ram area. They uh, increasingly use these shady old forests, not for feeding, but for loafing, for uh, uh, resting in the heat of summer. Uh, Something I think about when it gets up to 90, 100 degrees is, you know, where would you go if it was, if you were wearing a 75 pound fur coat, you know, in the middle of summer, you go into the shade, into these cool old swamps. I love this picture of the, of the grizzly in the garden. Um, they are, they are major ecosystem drivers up in the Alpine country. They are gardeners uh, aerating the soil and uh, redistributing uh, nutrients up in these, these really, uh, austere high uh, elevation environments. Next slide, please. Getting near the end, Sean, I think we've got a, just a few more. Again, uh, yeah, wet uh, and, and biologically diverse. Uh, the yak is not just about uh, 
the, the most endangered population of grizzlies. It's about salamanders. It's about boreal toads. It's about uh, frogs. It's about jumping slugs and these species of slug that was discovered in the proposed Unit 72. Uh, the yak is about water and black ram uh, that proposed timber sale is the U.S. headwaters of all that water. It's where it begins. Uh, and it's to be preserved, not destroyed. I believe that's that's all I've got uh, slide-wise. Um, oh, we've got a little footage that will show a, an aerial uh, aerial uh, perspective of Unit 72. This is the old large forest just to the south of the proposed sale. Again, it's the U.S. headwaters of the Yak River, uh, which is the largest tributary to the Kootenai. It's a place we must save and must protect, continue to protect across time. Happy to take any questions, Bob. Great. Um, thank you so much, Rick. So um, what I'm going to do now is give a quick update on what's happening with forest protection policy on the federal level and then cover some ways to take action. And then we're gonna open it up for uh, um, a Q&A uh, for both of us. So um, I think once we <laughs> once we can get the, uh, the slideshow off the, um, uh, the drone footage um, and get the slides back up, um, I can, I'll go ahead and get started. So that's uh, info on how to follow the um, the uh, Stop Black Ram and, and Rick's organization. Let's go to the next one. So um, I'm gonna, as I said, give a quick overview on what's happening with forest protection policy. So the we've had a couple developments just this spring, which have moved our campaign and our efforts forward. So the first is that on Earth Day, President Biden issued an executive order. The executive order uh, directs the agencies to define inventory and develop policy. It's not a rule and it's not a law. It's not something that's durable, but it's a really great start. And particularly notable, it includes mature forests, which is the first time we've ever seen mature forests mentioned in a presidential executive order. And it includes Bureau of Land Management lands, which is particularly significant, I think less so in Montana, but our friends in Oregon have a lot of Bureau of Land Management forests. And the biggest deal of all, the executive order talks about old forests as a climate solution. And we haven't seen that before. Next slide. So the next development is a more recent uh, Secretary Vilsack, who's the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which oversees the Forest Service, issued a secretarial memo. There's some good in that as well. It acknowledged that the uh, America's forests capture more than 10% of our nation's carbon emissions each year as well as listing benefits like clean water, biodiversity, cultural resources, and outdoor recreation. So we know that the USDA acknowledges how important our forests are. Unfortunately, the memo also includes the language that a primary threat to old growth stands on national forests is no longer timber harvesting. So we feel and know that logging and timber harvesting is a huge threat to old growth and mature trees and forests, but the Forest Service is downplaying that threat. So next slide. Starting today, there is a public comment period where the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service are asking for input on the definitions of mature and old growth. 
we want to use this as an opportunity to um, to to emphasize two points. One, that we this is urgent. We need speed. We need to be protecting these trees and forests as soon as possible. And then two, to make the case for protecting them because of carbon sequestration and habitat protection. And those are the main reasons that these, these forests should be protected from logging. And folks that are following uh, the campaign will, will be getting out more information about how to submit those public comments. So I just put two links in the chat. So what comes next? We are not gonna sit back, next slide. We're not gonna sit back while the um, for USDA and Department of Interior develop their policy. We have, we have a lot to say. So there are two opportunities to take action. Next slide. The first on Black Ram is to email your senator, senators about Black Ram. And if you live in Montana, we're actually asking you to call both of them as well. The message is to stop the Black Ram logging project and permanently protect remaining mature and old growth forest ecosystems. And I've put in the chat and on the slide a link to get the information for emailing or calling your senator. Everyone can call their senators. It doesn't just have to be people from Montana. And then next slide. We also have a petition to Secretary Vilsack, which I'll put the link in the chat there, which we'd love to have everybody sign. And then next slide, how to get involved in the climate forest campaign. We won't simply leave the future of our old growth and mature uh, trees and forests in the hands of the same federal agencies who have spent decades leasing them to timber companies. It's time for climate activists to ratchet up the pressure. So we want to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people across the country to call on President Biden to introduce <laughs> lasting, durable protections to mature and old growth forests from the threat of logging. And last slide, if you're interested in getting involved in the climate forest campaign, we, uh, we definitely recommend taking action and you can follow our hashtag on social media. So we're going to pull down the slides now and open it up for questions. So if folks have questions, you can put them in the, uh, in the chat or in the, um, in the Q and A and uh, Rick and I can answer them. And I think we lost Rick for a minute, but I think he's back. Rick, are you back? I am back and uh... Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and make it go off the screen now. I apologize for any lagginess or, or, or bad quality. My phone keeps dumping. Oh, start my video. Yep, all right. Um, all hopefully right. we can... Good. So any, through. yeah, any questions for, um, for Rick or for... Uh, for me about the campaign or about the timber sale or Black Ram. So um, Rick, I, I actually have a question for you. Um, what's your, what is your favorite uh, thing to, to do or to see in, the, in that area that, that you're working to protect? Uh, it, it's a great question. Um, and I, it's a, a pretty unimaginative answer uh, the water um, to get into the old forest you cross the west fork of, of the Yak River which is just uh, spectacular uh, hard charging you know mountain street and uh, quickly gets to uh, you know just roaring uh, uh, capacity with big boulders you know being transported and in the center of it a lot of logs crisscrossing a The, uh, the river each, each year, and then you um, 
you get into the wetlands where there are uh, you know tadpoles and polywogs and salamander uh, temporal ponds and marshes surrounded by sedges and then you uh, you cross the, uh, the the so-called fire line uh, this is hot blazing weedy clear cut uh, and go through a bunch of a uh, slash you know crawling over it's like hellish and then once you get through it and over it you're into the shade of the old forest and immediately just the, these giant cedar and and, and, and hemlock uh, with their their cooling shade and uh, and that soft substrate but but what i love is in the spring and early summer walking through there and seeing all the pockets and puddles of water in the root wads where, where one big tree is leaned over and another and these these excavations just these infinitude of tiny uh wetlands and and ponds uh, uh every time i see water in there it's it's uh i know that the forest is is doing the right the thing that it's it's made to do and and uh made to do the thing that it does um uh, some at, at the I mentioned that that clear cut the the fire line at the edge of it. it it's actively dewatering the old forest. Uh, we're really watching that with concern. Hopefully, the the clear cut will seal over with with vegetation and and uh, stop the bleeding of the dewatering coming out of the old forest uh, and being evaporated rather than continuing on to those uh, those wetlands into the west fork of the Yak. Um, I believe it will. I mean, an old forest doesn't get to be old by not, uh, you know, surviving a lot of challenges. But uh, and this is just one gash on one edge of it. On the, but it is on the down dip side, and so it is the clear cut is sucking all of the, not all, but a lot of the water out that previously had been retained by the old forest. It's it's injured. Uh, so we're watching it with uh, concern. But when we see water standing in the old forest, we know it's healing. Um, okay, so here's a here's a question from the audience, which um, Rick, I think this may be for you. And is there any reason to not believe the Forest Service statement, which is all treatments within designated old growth areas are designed to maintain and improve old growth characteristics on the land and ensure it persists into the future according to the requirements in the forest plan. No harvest of old growth is planned under the project. So I think that's specifically about the Black Ram project. Yeah, there's a really interesting word near the end of that long ass paragraph statement, um, the word required by forest plan. The Kootenai National Forest has a really uh, uh, dismaying habit of following the forest plan when it helps them log old growth or anything else they want to do and avoiding it when it gets in the way of their timber target. Uh, that same forest plan will direct them to not have clear cuts over the size of 40 acres, which is one giant clear cut. As we're seeing in Black Ram, I think the largest clear cut there is 293 acres. Forest plan says, no, don't do that. But um, you know they, they call it a requirement in the forest plan when it helps them get the target out. And they call it just a guideline when it gets in the way. Um, another key word in that long muddy paragraph is designated old growth. Uh, they have not designated the old forest at Black Ram as old growth. Uh, it's so old that parts of it don't even meet their met metrics for measuring old growth, which is really unimaginative. It's how many big trees per acre. And uh, I mean, you can run a transect through there and you can meet the green at all designation uh, for old growth, which is still qualitative, not it, they've tried to make it quantitative, but it's still a, it's a quality. Uh, and I ask you, uh, Kootenai National Forest, there's a forest that's 800 years old, never been logged, never been burned. Tell me if that's not old, what is? So you're saying it's possible for a forest to be so old <laughs> and have so many old growth characteristics that it defies forest service uh, categorization. A absolutely. There this forest is not like any other in the valley. It's, uh, it's off the charts. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the wildlife that live there? I know there were a lot of pictures of bears yeah, <laughs> on there. Yeah. Great question. Um, again, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has declared um, the Yak grizzly population the least resilient in North America, that is to say the most endangered. Uh, they're genetically isolated from even the nearby Cabinet Mountains, Cabinet Mountain Range. Um, long ago during the Timber Wars and the first uh, 
beginnings of the Endangered Species Act, uh, the government made a geopolitical designation of the Cabinet Yak ecosystem uh, because they're two mountain ranges near each other. Uh, the Selkirks are also near each other, but the, uh, it was convenient for uh, the timber industry to say, okay, we've got 50 grizzlies in the cabinet yak ecosystem rather than 25 in the yak and 25 in the cabinets. The bears and the cabinets have all gone extinct. Uh, the population that is there now is entirely artificial, uh, augmented by capturing bears in Canada or in the North Fork of the Flathead River and driving them in trucks and dropping them off in the cabinets. It, it's, a, it's a hostage and, and uh, struggling population in its own regard. Across the Kootenai River to the north in the Yak, uh, those 25 grizzlies, 24, 20, fewer and fewer each year, uh, they are entirely uh, native and have evolved across the, uh, the millennia from in, in relationship to the landscape they inhabit. Um, the limiting factor on grizzlies in the Yak is habitat security, uh, which is to say places where people will not kill them, which is to say places without roads. Uh, the Forest Service continues to uh, uh, advertise its timber sales as being good for grizzly bears because it, it's going to create more food for them. Uh, number one, that's not true. Uh, their study, they don't have studies that show clear cuts will increase huckleberry production. It's a theory and preliminary data shows that it doesn't, but uh, they're still using that theory to say if we had more huckleberries, if we had more clear cuts, we'd have more huckleberries. If we had more huckleberries, we'd have more bears. Again, just flies in the face of independent science. Uh, what grizzlies need to recover is to stop being killed. Uh, there's plenty of food in the yak. They are not food limited. Um, so that's, that's the primary value that, that the Black Ram area has for grizzlies in the yak. It's wild. It's, it's, it also creates great summer thermal cover, which will become even more important in coming years, uh, it holds surface water, which uh, uh, the large animals, grizzly, moose, elk, need every day. Uh, uh, there is an, an incredible uh, diversity, amphibious, amphibian diversity in, in the old forest. The spotted frogs, the um, uh, possibly leopard, more than leopard frogs, we haven't seen them yet, but if they're there, that's where they will be. Uh, the long-toed salamanders, the Coeur d'Alene salamanders, uh, the boreal toads. Uh, the, the solstice is the best, most exciting day to see the amphibians. Like we usually get a rain on the solstice and um, they'll become the, all of the, the march of the amphibians. They'll just be crawling and slithering uh, through the forest, uh, coming up from the river up slope to disperse into these high elevation swamps that uh, uh, it was really hard watching the, the fire line be bulldozed in 2018, just gashing, slicing right through this, this amphibious highway. And, uh, um, you know, it'll, it'll recover, but it'll need some help recovering and, and we hope to help it. Wow, that sounds really cool. Um, the, uh, the amphibian highway. Uh, all right, so I think um, if anyone has any final questions or thoughts or anything that they'd like to share, I'm gonna, say last call on, uh, on questions from the audience. So we'll pause and give people another minute uh, here. If they've got anything else um, and then uh, let folks get back, uh, back to their days. But um, thank you again, everybody so much for joining us to learn about this uh, really special place. I feel, um, feel like I've well, I, I would like to visit, um, but I feel like I understand even more uh, why it's so important to protect the Black Ram area from logging. So thank you so much for sharing with us. All right, final call for any questions. Uh, again, thanks everybody. We'll, um,